Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope you had some wonderful days here uh, at Virtual World's Best Practices in Education. Today we are in lecture area A and we'll have uh, Ova Saunders here giving us a presentation on the significance of virtual ideology. Um, she will share how virtual archaeology has expanded with new landscapes representing archaeological historical places that have been archaeological. Please welcome Nova Saunders. Hello, everybody. Wow, it almost feels like firecrackers going off in my ear. Hi, everybody. I am Nova Saunders, and uh, I'm going to put in live chat some real-life information uh, that I forgot to incorporate. Um, my real-life name is Marion Smeltzer, but everyone on the virtual platform knows me as Nova Saunders, and I am the curator or uh, cre yeah, creator and administrator of Nova Archaeology on the Vibe Grid. And I gave you the address there in live chat. In real life, I'm also a MAA practicing public archaeologist and cultural resource consultant. What that basically means is I'm the liaison between the private sectors and the education sectors. I'm the like middle person and I go in there and I talk to everybody. So on with the presentation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Archaeologists have effectively used the internet as a vehicle for public outreach and distribution for over 15 years. As new technologies develop, opportunities for education also appear. Virtual... Boo. I'm sorry, I just realized I had to click the button. Okay, uh, virtual reality through its numerous forms provides interactive experiences for the public as well as for the classroom. The benefits of utilizing virtual archaeology and virtual networks go well beyond academics and previous expectations. Virtual archaeology has expanded with new features and landscapes representing archaeological and historical places that have been part of the real-world archaeological research. Any proposed computer-based visualization will always aim to improve aspects relating to science, research, conservation or dissemination of our archaeological heritage. Visual illustrations and 3D models have enhanced the interaction experience that encourages others to see how text information is transformed into lifelike representations. The passing of information also encourages others to further explore other archaeological related collections and brings awareness to the continuing need to document to document where am I and archive our dwindling cultural resources that are quickly disappearing from accessibility. Equally important is the experience that students, educators, and the public gain in understanding the archaeological data to create replications of the past that can be easily shared with others. 
the ability to interact through a reconstruction of an actual site or area and combine assessments of previously documented investigations provides a familiar and a citable source. As early contributors of promoting and distributing archaeological knowledge virtually, Ben Ford, Scott Moore, Beverly Cerulli, Sarah Nessius, and myself created Archaeology Island on Second Life. The goal was to create real-life archaeological investigations from archaeological field school locations and research projects with reconstructed sites in 3D. Several years later, in May of 2011, a presentation titled Virtual Archaeology, Public Archaeology in Second Life was done for the Theoretical Archaeology Group in Berkeley, California. The presentation was well received, but there was a hint of skepticism about the need or even a future for virtual archaeology. And right here, I need to reiterate, uh, they said at that time that they loved what I did. They thought it was really exciting, but it was so far out of the box that they didn't know what to do with me. And I said, well, this is the plan. You could either sit back and watch what everyone else is doing and not be a part of it, or you could jump on the bandwagon. And that's kind of more or less how I left it. As anticipated, in the year 2011, more virtual 3D renditions were found in publications such as Professional Surveyor and on various websites, all promoting existing archaeological and historical sites around the world, each giving the viewer a more powerful insight to the details of the projects that would otherwise remain in text with pictures hidden behind a glass encasement or have restricted access. Okay, Beth. For example, a recent article was published about the virtual reconstruction of an area in Pompeii resulting from archaeological investigations. In Megan Geddon's article titled, 2,000-year-old Pompeii home reconstructed in 3D, published on October 7th of 2016, The author describes how archaeology researchers reconstructed a home in Pompeii to show what life was like 2,000 years ago. According to Gannon, the Swedish Pompeii project had been working to document the area since the year 2000, which included several buildings and gardens. And I tried to incorporate the slide to show just a small portion of it, but you really got to see it. It's absolutely gorgeous. On the same subject, Peter Dockle wrote an article titled, This Reconstructed 3D Home Reveals Ancient Pompeii Before Vesavius Struck. And excuse my inability for correct pronunciation. That was published May 5th. Uh, no, I'm sorry, October 5th, 2016. In his article, Dockle stated the project is now overseen by the re researchers 
at the Lodge University. Uh, of Sweden and explained that according to the university, the primary purpose of the video was to provide the public with a glimpse into oh my goodness, where are my slides? Okay. Into the conditions of ancient Pompeii life, the overall aim of the research is more scientific. The team will be sharing their entire 3D data set and workflow to make the reconstruction process completely transparent and available for researchers and students. Now, mind you, at this point, it was only available to the academic world, okay? And the walk around video of the reconstructed home from ancient Pompeii, <clears throat> excuse me, those involved with the research explain how elements were used during the process to archive the final results using 3D technology. The video can be found um, on YouTube and hopefully you see that link. And if not, then I will try to give it to you individually. Another interesting virtual rendition was mentioned in several articles relating to 16th century 3D reconstruction in Scotland. The national website newspaper in Scotland posted an article by Christine Patterson titled App Bring 16th Century Edinburgh Back to Life on March 17th, 19, or 2017. Wow, I'm so sorry. In Patterson's article, she stated how tourists can explore a lost township with a new interactive tool. Patterson clarifies that the 3D renditions were based on a drawing done by the English military engineer named Richard Lee. By working with historians, archaeology evidence, and documented resources of that time, the reconstruction illustrates an overview of the entire land townscape of the city as it would have been seen at that time. The app, which can be used on mobile phones, was created through a group of experts from St. Andrews University and Smart History and made available in May of 2017. In Diane King's article titled Video Experience, 16th century Edinburgh, she reiterates on the Scotland reconstruction stating the app to view the 16th century Edinburgh can be downloaded on iTunes or Google Play. She explains further how the video shows several views of the landscape with focus on the Royal Mile, which is a historic spine of Edinburgh as well as other interesting landmarks. King continues with an excerpt from Dr. Bess Rhodes, who helped with the reconstruction, stating, it has been amazing seeing the reconstruction of the lost townscape. I hope this project makes the public more aware of the layers of the capital's history and furthers understanding of the complex way in which Edinburgh evolved. As for Archaeology Island, we are pleased to say it has found a new virtual platform. All the creations and contents were successfully relocated in 2009 to the Virtual Islands for Better Education, acronym the IBE, 
We have reached the intended goals of having both a learning environment and a public outreach venue with areas still thriving and growing. And uh, I need to reiterate here, we have five regions. Uh, we have the Maine and then uh, the Light Woodland Culture. Aspiring Archaeologists is a place where I have uh, all the students and any uh, poster presentations they did. Um, there's uh, a large Native American culture exhibit there. Uh, there's a very large field school exhibit there. Um, and then uh, Allegheny Portage Part 1 and Part 2. And I will talk about those two areas in one moment, okay? Oh, here we go. Our most recent region additions in the Allegheny Portage Railroad, Site 1 and 2, representing the transformation of the area to accommodate the finishing piece of the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal. This project was done in collaboration with the NPS staff and Nancy Smith, the cultural resource manager at ALPO, using three main models, the Skew Arc Bridge, the Engine House Number 6, and the Lemon House. A three-minute video shows the process to reduce the reproductions at the NPS Allegheny Portage Railroad National Historic Site using the LACA C10 laser scanner. The data taken from the scans were processed with Cyclone 3D point cloud processing software, and then the reconstructed completed models were retextured and applied to the virtual world setting. And then I'm showing you a link on where you could see uh, the complete process. And, and this was my thesis, so this was a, a big pain in the neck to do. On to slide 10. In May of 2017, and excuse me, colleagues, for not saying your name. Once again, I don't do well. Uh, Petros and Quanta from the, uh, whoa. <laughs> From the Archaeology Museums and Ancient History and Second Life extended a welcome to tour their area. The cultural and educational regions there consist of seven levels relating to buildings of museums that are reconstructions in true scale according to archaeological principles and findings. There is a small archaeological site completed with tools of the trade and various slides or slideshows around the area listing other archaeological investigations. Just to name a few features there, at Orbis Ramos you can walk through the Roman urban environment and visit ancient monuments. The Ortum Project is a detailed museum of Roman invention developments. You can visit a hall at the Vatican Library and turn the pages of their collections. At Menon Museum, there are posters and replications of the mysterious civilization. At the Chateau, you can walk in the past visiting a famous castle on the River Loire, France, and then visit the royal residence at Tussaud in Denmark in the Viking Age. And I tried to incorporate as many pictures as I could here. Uh, and I failed to mention that you could always take a carriage ride, which is really cool. You just sit on this buggy and the carriage goes through all these interesting sites and kind of gives a narration of, of what's going on. So you got to go and see it because it's really cool. 
I eagerly accepted the invitation to join the group and space was provided for an exhibit that I currently maintained titled Archaeology Is. Inside the area are models and panels explaining basic archaeological principles that can be applied to current academic courses. Two smaller rooms to the side explain underwater archaeology and dendrochronology, which is three ring dating. A second floor in the building hosts three types of new technologies used in current archaeological investigations. The geophysical in instruments shown there are the IDS 3X multiple array ground penetrating radar, the GSSI SIR system 3000 ground penetrating radar, and it kind of looks like a glorified lawnmower, and the LACA scan station C10 3D scanner. Each unit has information screens explaining how they are used and screen image results. And I tried to incorporate the pictures. The first one in the, has got the hallway with the pictures and uh, describes what each panel is. And then, of course, the underwater archaeology. The dendrochronology uh, area is super, super nice. I like that. And, uh, of course, where my, my geosurvey material is. All right, in conclusion, as scientists, historians, anthropologists, and archaeologists scramble to maintain stability in their field, so are the pre-existing demands of documentation, archiving, and distributing shared information to an awaiting community whose main interest is to reflect on the cultural past for future generations. Unfortunately, not all cultural sites can be preserved and protected. Current events in the U.S. has listings of treasured landscapes, sacred grounds, and historical properties losing their fight against progress, leaving little time, if any, to fully document the area before its destruction. This daunting task of what is determined as a cultural resource has been renegotiated by extreme measures and in some instances even falsified to make room for development. Please join us in expanding to the collections relating to virtual archaeology because its significance is worth something to everyone. Thank you. Hopefully I have saved time for questions and answers, if I have answers, so I will just be quiet. Okay, I, I think I need to get off the stage now. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Nova, for this wonderful presentation. I think that was very interesting. And yes, I think also that it is very much 
a good idea to have it in virtual to to have the sites in virtual if not served in. so thank you No, I'm sorry. I did not. Let me go back and look. Oh my God, I gotta get rid of this thing. Hang on. Okay, let me see if I could find Stephen's question. Now, Stephen, could you reiterate and tell me what the question was again? I'm sorry. Is there a new generation of laser screening technology? Oh, Lord. Uh, Stephen, I'll be honest with you. Right now, the way that um, the way that the outline is for the archaeologists is we, we have to do everything by way of GPR. Uh, and that's what they're promoting. They're not promoting any shovel testing whatsoever because they're saying that it's very time consuming so that's what we're going to be doing it's going to be more uh scan operations and as far as converting everything uh you know what i got a lot of help from my friends of course you're one of them so what i can't do i usually tap on everyone else's shoulder and they help me through it but so far, so good. The biggest problem I'm having is getting new material from other people because you're not seeing how this platform could be used to their benefit. Now, eventually, the government's going to shove us all underneath the rug and all our research is going to be archived. Who's going to see it? So I'm going to be the door crasher and say, you know what? Give me your material and I will make sure that it lives instead of being ignored. So that's where my platform is. And I hope I answered that question. Thank you. Yeah, Morgan, it is sad. And unfortunately, like I said, uh, right now, everything is based on having to do with completing a project. In other words, if there's like a big empty field and they're not letting us go ahead and do research on it first, then they just take their bulldozers and go over the property. And then lo and behold, there's a uh, gravestone that's overturned, a coffin overturned, or something else is overturned. And then they have this panic going, well, I guess we need the archaeologist out here. Well, yeah, duh, you should have called us out here in the very beginning. And we could have told you not to put the bulldozer there. And I'm Yes, there, there are laws, but if it's not on government property, we are not, uh, we're not told to go out there. So in other words, the land has to be owned by the government in order to designate a phase one archaeological investigation. Many of these properties are not government, but they hold a lot of cultural significance. And that's where the big panic comes in. Um, there are a lot of towns that have been lost and the graveyards are still there. 
So what they do is uh, the town is just rebought by another private developer. They remove the gravestones. After 10 years, no one knows what's underneath the ground. And then here comes the, the renovators, and they're digging up people. And they have this, like, big panic attack on what to do. Uh, another uh, thing that I had discovered through my research was that during the Civil War, they used arsenic to embalm people to keep them going from one place to the other to, to transform, uh, transfer the bodies. Now, that's one of the little known secrets that we're not supposed to talk about, but it's a public health risk. And I have been banned, slapped in the hand, chastised, and oh my God, I don't even want to begin to tell you what they've done to me. But they keep telling me to shut up, and I'm going, no, if I'm finding a Civil War gravesite, and I already know that they embalmed the body, and there's a water source about four miles behind it or around it, I am going to designate it as a health risk. And you could do your land probes and all you want. I don't care. But I'm going to be the voice for the people. Because my job is to work for the people. Your job is to cover your butt. My job is to work for the people. And plain and simple, that's what I do. Sorry. Oh, my God. Uh, you're going to have to talk to Stephen. Stephen, stand up and, and talk to Conga. He wants to donate. Meantime, if you know any archaeologists and educators, bonk them over the head, send them my way. I would love to talk to them. Because the more collaboration I have, the better off our cause is getting Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know how you would reach me. Let, let me, I, I hope this is permitted. I'm, I'm going to put up my email address in local chat. Okay, I expect everyone to write it down. And I want to see a flood of emails. I don't care if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Just let me know what your thought is. Mm 